We're live. Thank you, Don. Welcome. Welcome to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm so glad to be here with everyone today on Zoom and in Facebook and uh, the people even in the future. I'm thinking about you and feeling you and just glad that we'll be sharing these readings together. Today is our poet's focus on the theme of May Day with featured guest Margaret O'Regan, Tim Evans, Dana Patterson, and Rachel Hegarty, followed by our live open mic. I'm your host, Angela Driven, uh, feeling very fortunate to get to be here, joining you today from the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, with a welcome to all of you joining us live in our Zoom poetry studio and those of you watching live on Facebook. Thank you for being there. The chats are live, so please send the love as someone from today will be receiving this week's gratitude gift. I love that. Gratitude is its own gift, but I love the idea of a gratitude gift. For those of you who are interested in reading in the live open mic, We'll just send a private message to Kim Ports Parsons in the chat, and we'll post the list of participants we can accommodate today in the chat during the program. Kim, Kim will take care of all of that. She's part of the magic. Um, before I introduce our May Day guest, I want to just give you a little bit of history about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. CV Live Poetry held our first reading on March 29th, 2020, in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere, and has developed into an international, intersectional, and intergenerational reading series and poetry community. Now we have over 2,600 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between our new book showcase our poets focus reading with a themed live open mic and occasional special events like May 16th conversation and poetry with three generations of Asian American women poets. And today we're doing poets focus on May Day, International Workers Day, Labor Day, a spring festival uplifting of the season of the bloom, a time for demonstration of all the hard work happening beneath the earth's crust, a time of calling for help, and a time of coming to aid. We are extraordinarily fortunate to have readers representing all of the facets of May Day today. And we're going to begin with Margaret O'Regan, a retired law clerk and a lifelong political activist. She is a co-host of DeBar's Spoken Word from Ireland and is a regular open mic reader in various poetry groups in Ireland, the UK, and the US. Her work covers a broad spectrum of life experience from erotic poems and those which address social injustice. Margaret, I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Angela, um, for my first poem, um, a couple of references in it. Um, I mentioned the Magdalene laundries, which were places that incarcerated pregnant women in Ireland up to the 90s and they are still very controversial today because we've um, discovered through journalists that were brave enough to publish it. Um, in, in one of them, for instance, in Tume in County Galway, um, several hundred uh, bodies of babies were found buried in a tank in the ground there. Um, and there have been a lot of scandals about them. So um, this is called Guilt Trip. And it mentions that, and it also mentions two women, and Lovett is one of them. She was a 14-year-old pregnant schoolgirl, and she died giving birth, and her baby died as well outdoors. She, she wasn't able to tell anyone. She couldn't talk about it. This was in the 80s. The same decade, Eileen Flynn was sacked from her job as a teacher by the nuns, her employers. 
um, because she was living with a man she wasn't married with, big sin. So guilt trip. I took a guilt trip for a walk. And as I walked, it gathered thought. And with each step, it grew and grew until it got to this. What if? What if the church did not have sway over the masses and the state? Then would and love it still be here? Would Eileen Flynn still teach each year? Would women have been churched at all? Would Magdalene's exist or no? Would mother baby homes have spread? Would contraception needs be met? Well, then the guilt trip took a flip. What if the guilt was theirs, not ours? Hoist on their own petard are they. It is now time to make them pay. To right their wrongs, we must be strong to rid us of this dirty throng. Their revelations fatal are, we'll strip them of their wealth et al. By now, from seething silently, we are the strong, they are the weak. We are no longer mild or meek. Repeal equality, all told. The tide has turned and power is ours. James Connolly, he got it right. For our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. That's that one. Um, <clears throat> now the next one is written, trying to um, find a link between the austerity that was forced upon us in Ireland in the 80s and really all over the world um, and comparing it to now and what we can see after COVID, um, there will be a huge attempt to make us workers pay for it. It's called Inside Out. Ah, yes, you contented fat cats. Oh, yes, I remember you well. You told us the system was fine. All would always fall into line. You said market forces prevailed, that all would be hearty and hale. But of course, you could not see why hospital cuts could not be. You chopped and you chopped. You blew the house down, then went cap in hand with your house of sand. Your greasy hands in the till, your bailouts did give you your fill. As you demanded and received our dosh and dough so easily. Market forces are now dead. Shame on you who are now fed. Off our sweat and labor mound, you're a robber of our pounds. But we are now uniting to form a force for fighting. This time, when you come knocking, we are not for copying. We'll resurrect our Connolly spirit and his citizen army tradition. Um, now, at the moment in Ireland, about the, the biggest workers resistance at the moment has been the Debenhams workers. Just at the very, very beginning of COVID in 2020, in March, they, they were actually um, made redundant. And the method of informing them was by email. And most of those workers in Ireland, in the 11 stores um, throughout the South, um, they were already trained in Roach's stores. So they've like, some of them have over 30 years working experience. And since Debenhams arrived in Ireland, they've actually amassed huge profits for Debenhams. And they've been treated abominably. And this will give you an idea of, of the things that happened to them. It's the name of the um, trade union campaign is The Devil Wears Debenhams. And this is an acrostic poem. And that's, that's down on the left-hand side as well, the title, The Devil Wears Debenhams. These Debenhams workers, have paved the way every minute of every day. Dignified women and men are they. Evil devils in Debenhams they face. Villainous vultures in boardroom culture. Imagine they can with their despicable plan lord it over the workers they slammed. But workers throw it on the scrap heap, erupt and fight back. Everyone so determined in this first COVID strike. A win for these workers is a win for us all, refusing to kowtow, not taking a fall. 
staying the course in all 11 stores. Debenhams directors, contemptible, covetous cretins, each and every one a grasping, avaricious louse. By standing up together, wherever they gather, every one of these workers will go hell for leather, not ending solidarity at home and far afield has enveloped these brave fighters in a force field and revealed a strength and revelation so supremely divine, making them the spearhead of revolt during COVID, standing firm and steadfast in face of corporate greed. Now, one of the um, things that happened late last year was in Ireland, um, a high court judge was appointed to the Supreme Court. It was like promotion for him. And before he actually took up the appointment, um, he was discovered to have breached the regulations in relation to COVID. And it, the, the um, ensuing um, story was called Golfgate. It was a golf outing by the Irish um, members of parliament, TDs, Chokta Dáile, and also bankers at the top of the banking chain, obviously, and judges. And this was one of the judges and he, his surname is W-O-U-L-F-E. Um, and because I'm a retired law clerk, I couldn't resist using all the, all the terms, the legal terms. Like when I say writ large, it's W-R-I-T. And I refer to the four courts, it's the address of where the Supreme Court and the High Court sit in Dublin. Um, it's called Wolf Whistle because one of the um, one of the journalists was the whistleblower about it. Wolf Whistle. The wolf is glued to his chair, his seat not yet overthrown. From the four courts bustle, wigs and gowns rustle, finding against the golf gate hustle. The chief has just served a missive writ large to remove the wolf whistle, but the wolf is still glued to his chair. He swears he won't bow to beer pressure. He lolls in his chambers at leisure, supremely supine in face of decline, no notion of what is in motion. From beyond his lofty dominion, round the four corners, public opinion. And he, he's still there, he's sitting tight, he's not moving. He's just, you know, um, has a brass neck and he's staying there. I don't believe he can ever sit on the Supreme Court because what, um, what judgment could he ever stand over? Um, how am I doing for time there, Angela? I have about three minutes if I can. Yes, ma'am, keep going. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, this is the kind of a spoken word piece rather than a poem, and I'm just ending the, the, the thing with this because it's, again, about the Debenhams workers, and um, they, were, they were mounting a picket 24 hours a day, every day, for the past year and more, and the, um, the Irish courts found against them and sent in KPMG, the receiver, to collect the um, the stock that was left in the stores, and two stores have been um, have have been successfully, um, I suppose, the stock has been successfully removed from two of them from their point of view. But this is what the legacy. What I'm comparing the legacy of the strikers with the legacy of the police. The Irish police are called on guard as Shirkana, um, and I'm comparing the legacy that each group of them will leave behind. So legacy. The Debenham strikers will leave a legacy for their children, grandchildren, all who live in Ireland and all the generations to come. We will remember them for their continuing year-long heroic stance against the might of the Irish state on Garda Shirkana, the courts, KPMG and Debenhams. We will remember their courage, tenacity, grit and determination. We will remember their first thought on being made redundant, communicated to them by email. Their first thought, was the plight of the 69 Bangladeshi workers of Debenhams who were also redundant because a clothing contract was terminated. They raised money for these workers while on strike for their own rights. We will remember their continuing selfless determination to force the government to implement 
the Duffy Cahill Report to copper fasten redundancy rights, not for themselves, but for all succeeding generations of workers in Ireland. We will remember their dignity and strength on the picket around the country in all weathers. We will remember the songs in Henry Street and Tralee and that inspiring slow march in Tralee in front of the giant juggernaut full of the stock they worked so hard to secure. We will remember in Cork, baby Grace, a baby born during COVID and during this monumental strike, a baby who was iconic since the second she was born and whose mother, Claire, continued picket duty and organized the campaign's social media throughout her pregnancy and since. We will remember Valerie Conlon, shop steward, emerging victorious, leading her fellow trade unionists during the occupation and organizing action days and continuing pickets. Above all, we will remember their valued friendship forged from conversations at the cold base of the picket for the rest of our lives. What a legacy each and every one of them leave behind. Contrast the above with the following. On Garda Shir Kona, what legacy are they leaving? They will leave a legacy for their children and grandchildren. We will remember each and every one of them for not having the gumption to exercise their right to conscientiously refuse to obey their orders on moral or ethical grounds. Each and every one who was involved in assisting KPMG and Debenhams. Each and every one who has breached COVID regulations by not just permitting, but aiding and abetting non-essential work to take place. Each and every one who has passed the strikers' pickets. Each and every one who has physically removed these strikers, mostly mothers and grandmothers. Each and every one who has escorted juggernauts of trucks full of stock, which these strikers were protecting. We will remember each and every one who has said, we are just doing our job instead of doing the right thing. That's it, and thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, thank you so much. Um, one of the gifts of poetry is, to me, is learning. And uh, I feel confident that I just received many, many lessons. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for reading today. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes uh, we support poets and support poetry by purchasing uh, books or by leaving reviews or submitting reviews. Um, but Margaret reminds me that one of the greatest ways to support poetry is probably to deeply listen and to live in a way that shows that we're deeply listening to the work. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Um, next, we have Tim Evans, a poet, activist, and co-founder of Live Poet Society, a revolutionary socialist party collective based in Swansea, Wales. Over the past five years, they have organized many live poetry nights sometimes drawing almost a hundred people. Tim's work has appeared in several journals and anthologies, and he has published two collections of poetry. Do you want some and exit 42 with a third we can look forward to in preparation. Tim. Right, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, just wanted to start by expressing solidarity with the Debenham strikers and also expressing uh, total admiration for James Con Connolly, one of the greatest Irish revolutionary, in fact, the greatest Irish revolutionary socialist. Okay, just wanted to say something briefly about May Day. Um, uh, yeah, it's a celebration of spring maypoles, but as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, International Workers' Day, a celebration of international working class solidarity. It began just a quick history in the USA in 1886. Workers were fighting for the eight hour day. And in 1890, for the first time, workers across uh, the world uh, commemorated it, which forced most European governments but not actually the UK, to declare it a public holiday. Since then, it's been a rallying point 
uh, for solidarity, for justice, and for workers' rights all over the world yesterday. You wouldn't have noticed it looking at the mainstream media, but all over the world yesterday, marches and demos, some of which, as in Turkey, where over 200 people were arrested, were brutally suppressed by the police. In the UK, too, there is a bill going through which would effectively criminalise protest. Um, and make uh, people who go on marches liable for £10,000 fines and so on and so forth. There are big protests in Britain against that now, and there were big protests yesterday. I want to read three poems, all of which focus on May Day as Workers' Day. And I want to start with a poem about the catastrophic fire at Grenfell, now, in, on the 14th of June, 2017, 72 people died when a tower block in central London burnt down, mainly poor people, um, often people of colour. Um, and um, nearly four years later, people are still, still waiting to be rehoused. People have had nothing approaching justice. None of the private companies who used um, toxic materials in the building of the thing have been prosecuted. And in many ways, the worst thing, people living in similarly dangerous blocks are now faced with ruinous bills as they are forced to uh, pay to make their own homes safe. The poem takes its structure from People may be familiar with Bob Dylan's Who Killed Davy Moore, which of course is itself taken from an earlier folk song called Who Killed Cock Robin. So this is it, Who Killed Grenfell? Who was it killed the people of Grenfell? Who put their lives at deadly peril? Very well, I'll resign, said Paget Brown. But it wasn't me who put them down. I didn't give them the runaround. I didn't want them out of town. Their deaths aren't down to my account. No, I didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Who was it killed the people of Grenfell who put their lives at deadly peril? Not us, said the leaders of the TMO. It shouldn't be us that have to go. We listened. We really listened, you know. We dealt with their complaints like the seasoned pros we are and that our <clears throat> salaries show. No, we didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Who was it killed the people of Grenfell who put their lives at deadly peril? Not me, said Housing Minister Barwell. I was always 100% impartial. My door was always wide open as normal. We had endless meetings, minuted and formal. My interests were in no way commercial. No, I didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Grenfell, who was it killed the people of Grenfell who put their lives at deadly peril? Not us said the 72 Tory MPs. We never voted down that amendment, you see, to make rented property safe and clean. And while we're all landlords, as it seems, we didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Who was it killed the people of Grenfell who put their lives at deadly peril? It wasn't me, said Boris Johnson. I closed 10 fire stations? That's just nonsense. The Knightsbridge one was of special importance. Just next to Grenfell, by all the evidence. Thank God I don't have that on my conscience. No, I didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Who was it killed the people of Grenfell who put their lives at deadly peril? Not us, said the British government. You can't threaten any of us with imprisonment. A bonfire of regulations. That was our sentiment. Health and safety just filled us with merriment. For business and profits, there must be no impediment. We didn't kill the people of Grenfell. We didn't kill the people of Grenfell. We didn't kill the people of Grenfell. Thanks. So that's the first one. There's Next one is one called Freedom Song. It's about the wider situation that we have at the moment. There are those who would divide us. 
Their reasons are quite plain. Downtown racists strut their stuff pumped up on cheap cocaine. Brecht said the beast was still in heat that spawned the camps of death. The corporate zombies of the elite have nothing to express except to make us fear and hate another skin or creed. Leave drowning children to their fate and laugh while others bleed. But we outnumber the dogs of hate and unity is strong. The fate of my brother is my own fate. And I sing my sister's song. We sing together side by side, Muslim, Christian, Jew, black and brown and gay and straight, trans and lesbian too. For love is stronger far than hate. And love is what we pay. And love is where we seek to be at the dying of the day. So care for all the refugees. Fleeing wars our government sowed. British ministers sipped their gin as the bombing was proposed. Bogus kingdoms signed and sealed and delivered to the CIA, who sent a memo, just leave us the names of the people to betray. So stand with those who flee all wars in solidarity, as we stand with our class across the world in our longing to be free. Stand with all of the oppressed, no more an internee, Tear down these prisons and these jails. All people shall be free. And a very quick, shorter last one, which is uh, this one. This one is for Boris Johnson and it's called Stand Aside. These are not normal times. This is not business as usual. This is not a time for nursery rhymes protocols or burnt out rituals. The world is hungry for other things, things that you can never offer. Water from the mountain springs, wealth from within a common coffer. Your jeering future insults our lives, obscuring memories of the sun. If we wish just to survive, we must undo what you have done. So stand aside. You stink of corruption. Your time came once, now it has gone. The only politics worth a damn protects the poor from the strong. The only politics worth a damn is not aimed at the distressed, but stands with the workers and the poor and fights for the hungry and oppressed. The only politics worth a damn will make the walls of the city shake and turn the old world upside down. What your power builds, our power unmakes. Okay, that's my lot, guys. Thanks for listening. I look forward to hearing all the other comrades who will who will read tonight okay cheers guys thank you angela thanks for listening thank you tim thank you i i love the imperative nature of your work and the voice you deliver it in so much strength and conviction and it's and it's and it's like this is so solid and so strong and I just the fate of my brother is my own fate and I sing my sister's song I will I will not forget that thank you thank you um we are taking a, a shift to gaze on May Day in a in a different way as we move into our next reader you know as poets part of what we do is is look and and uh, a lot of what we write is right on looking and how we how we look and Dana Dana Patterson 
um, is a writer, a textile artist, and an amateur fungophile. She's the author of Titania in Yellow from Port Belly Press 2019. My copy is completely uh, damp and twisted from all the baths I've taken reading it. That's my favorite place to read poetry, and that book has spent taking a lot of baths with me. And if Mother Braids a Waterfall from Signature Books 2020, her second full-length collection, Oh Lady, Speak Again, is forthcoming from Signature Books in 2023. She's also the founding editor-in-chief of Saltry and Liar, an online journal dedicated to publishing literature at the intersection of faith and doubt. In her spare time, she curates poetry and fungus. Uh, Dana, I'm so glad you're here today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Angela. And thank you, Dawn and Kim for um, hosting this. I love this poetry reading series. It's such a generous space. And I've learned so much from Margaret and from Tim. Thank you for your words today. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Rachel. I couldn't not share this poem called May Day, <laughs> which is in my book, If Mother Braids a Waterfall. May Day. In a Western town, in the foothills of the Wasatch, folk still gather on the green adjacent the church to flower wreath crown their festival queen. They come in overalls and scraped clean boots, straw hats and hard vowels. They come in cotton dresses and petal plated hair, scrubbed faces and gleaming hope. They come to watch the young circle the maypole, ribbons in primaveral colors weave, unweave. And county kin surround them, clapping hands, stomping feet, keeping rhythm. This ancient beat of bloom, harvest, snow, and bloom again. All hunger and hard times, like heavy winter quilts stowed away in cedar chests. All the cold, for a time, forgotten in their queen's hummingbird smiles, in the deep dimples of the dairy farmer's son. I'm going to share a poem from my chapbook, Titania and Yellow. And this poem is for Angela. This is, um, as you might imagine, this chapbook riffs on Shakespeare's uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And this is a self-portrait as Bottom, Bottom the Weaver, after he's transformed and has the ass head and sees Titania and falls in love with her. And I imagine Titania, she could be the fairy queen, but she could also um, be a metaphor for poetry and the muse. And as poets, that, that, that love that we have um, when we feel visited by the muse. And um, at, here in the United States, we're just finishing up National Poetry Month. All of April is National Poetry Month. So I'm thinking about that love of poetry that we experience. Self-portrait as bottom, beloved. Sweet queen, your breath is clover and honey and hay, magic and moon sway and salt. How can I ever love another creature after you deigned to love me, a monster, rude mechanical, dregs on the importance scale? After you stooped to skyward vault me, after your firmament untethered my bray, unharnessed me from this mortal grossness, up, up, till I began to believe there's no such thing as death, no direction but launch. You fleshed me with wings, I spotted, 
and taught me the probing tongue, the toothsome crust. And chrysalis me in your nebular dust, where we dwell in possibility, burst and burst. Descend again, goddess, O oh, nymph, O oh, muse, flay me alive with your love. I'm going to share one more poem. This is um, the past year and a half, I've been experimenting with a new form that I'm calling poem broidery, where I'm mashing together a poem <laughs> with an embroidery. And so I'm gonna share my screen here so that you can see it um, as I read it. Uh, um, so in just a week, in the United States is uh, Mother's Day. And so May often, uh, May Day, I start thinking about mothers and the importance of mothers and motherhood. Are you all able to see that okay? The poem broidery? Okay. So this, um, uh, this was published in uh, the most recent issue of Hotel America. They published the prose poem version, but here you are seeing the, uh, the poem broidery version. Red handed. Chopping beets for borscht, my daughter, do I look like a murderer? Shoves her ruddied hands in my face. I pull one of her hairs from my mouth, dyed red, from beet juice swirling in my bowl, gold beads of chicken fat in the broth, her hair in my mouth with cabbages and carrots, reminding me who made this meal, this sustenance, this girl I grew from my beet red womb after pills procedures, files of blood, the hysterosalpingogram, when dye bloomed from each fallopian tube, a poisonous flower spelling dead end. Each month, its petals shed bright drops in the shower, scrawling failure. How she sustains me, our to hour. A beet is not a tuber, but a taproot that grows heart-shaped. She at seven weeks, seven millimeters, no bigger than a bean. Her pinhead heart flaring on screen, a bright jolt. A beet's rich scarlet derives from pigments called betalanes. And I, a kind of accomplice to the crime called mother, as in my body gutted and the I, I was, became carcass. Who else can I call murderer? But she made me host and hostage, a beet seed is tiny as a grain of sand. It grows round and bulbous in the dark. I went willingly, but witness she was red-handed from the start, guilty when I ousted her the evidence plain to see. Her flailing on my chest, her hands small blades, cut open the blue veins of sky. The sun bled and bled, crimson streaked her hands, vernix creased, her hands chopped the air, as if to say all of this, all of it. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Um, as I listen, I am so struck by the, the language, like how thoughtful you are of each word and its sound and and it's just, it blows me away. And the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking about, and I'm so excited to hear Rachel read next, is how not only does every poet write differently, every poet reads their work differently. And there's something in that, you know, there's, there's a reason, there's, there's something behind how they choose to read. And every time I hear you read, I, I am um, in awe an admiration of how patiently you let each sound come. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm so excited. Uh, we're so we're taking another turn, right? To look at to look at May Day in in yet a, another way. And uh, I'm, I just I'm so glad that I get get to be here and be part of this and watch this ball of energy just, just move and look at May Day in these different ways. Um, Rachel Haggerty is a Dubliner. Her debut collection, Flight Paths Over Fingless, I hope I said that right, uh, <laughs> won the 2018 Shine Strong Award. A child survivor of the Talbot Street bomb, Rachel's May Day, 1974, Salmon, 2000, out with Salmon, 2019, she's one of Sandy's Salmon Sisters, has received international acclaim. Rachel's forthcoming collection is called Dancing with Memory. Rachel's kids say she uses the three F words too much, fingless, feminism, and fecking poetry. We're so glad to have you here, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you so much to Angela and Sandy and all of the team at Cultivating Voices. Happy May Day, everybody. May the blossoms of the hawthorn land on your doorstep and shield you and yours from bad magic. So it, it's been an absolute honor to, an honor and a revelation to be listening and first of all reading, but mostly listening to Margaret O'Regan, Tim Evans, and Dana Patterson. Labs, they were gorgeous. I feel like sustained and ready to go out to the barricades. <laughs> so thank you very much to the barricades while wearing apple blossom in my hair, maybe. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, so uh, yeah, this is called May Day 1974. And first I would like to thank um, all of the American poetry tradition, uh, I got this idea from Claudia Rankin's um, citizen book um, of docu-poetry. And um, to date, I have bought three copies of Claudia Rankin citizen and there, three of them have gone out of the house. My sons are 15 and 16 year olds and they're active in the Black Lives Matter movement. And I suspect that they and their friends are taking a Marxist approach to my poetry collection and taking it. So, but Claudia Rankin's book was great. Uh, Cole Mountain Elementary, Mark Novak's book is very good. One Big South, C. Day Wright's book. And of course, Timbea, Jess, Olio, and, uh, and then we have the mother of all of us docu-poets, uh, Muriel Ruxtex and her work on all of those wonderful and tragic coal miners. So thank you to uh, the American tradition for helping me um, and, and the Seamus Heaney Centre where they uh, were great and said to me, yeah, you can do whatever you like. And then uh, Seamus Heaney said, not only can you do whatever you like, you probably are going to do whatever you like, so go for it. So this is what was happening. So um, I'll read you the introduction from May Day 1974. Um, and that will give you a little bit of context and I'll, then I'll read two poems out of it. The 17th of May, 1974 was the worst day of the troubles. Three car bombs exploded in Dublin city centre. The first at 528 on Parnell Street, the second at 530 on Talbot Street and the third at 532 on South Leinster Street. 
At 6.58, another car bomb exploded on the North Road in Monaghan Town. As a result of these four car bombs, 34 people died, plus a full-term baby, and almost 300 people were treated for injuries. Many witnesses saw the outcomes of these terrorist attacks. Dead bodies, dying men, women and children, decapitated corpses, mutilated limbs, and a motherless toddler wandering the streets, too shocked to cry. People saw things that cannot be unseen. My mother, brother and I survived that day. We were crossing from Talbot Street to North Earl Street at the time of the second explosion. Ma threw me into the pram with my little brother. Then she ran for our lives. This collection contains 33 ballads and 33 docu-sonnets to commemorate the dead. The ballads are products of my imagination. The short biographies of the victims come from Justin Barron's report. The docu-sonnets are crafted for Baton with allowances for Nietzsche and Jung from the bereaved family's testimonies in the public domain government statements, coroner's depositions, YouTube footage, and the Yorkshire television documentary called The Hidden Hand, The Forgotten Ma Massacre. Even though eyewitnesses were able to identify the drivers of the stolen cars that carried the explosions, no one has ever been charged or brought to court. The grieving families and survivors are still awaiting a public inquiry, the truth and justice. It should also be noted that nearly all of the victims of that May Day bombing were working class. The majority of them were women and children. Patrick Askin, forestry worker, married Glasslock, County Monaghan, killed in the Monaghan bomb, survived by his wife, Patricia, and four young children. Patrick and Paul, aged six and five, and two-year-old twin daughters, Sonia and Sharon. Paddy Askin Jr.'s deposition and statement at the coroner's court, the 21st of the 4th, 2004. I am Paddy Askin, the eldest son of the deceased Patrick Askin. On Fridays, my father was in the habit of changing his wages in Monaghan Town. And as usual, on the 17th of May, 1974, he went to Grecian's pub. On that evening, I was at home with my mother, brother Paul and sister Sharon and Sonia. We heard the bomb and although it was four miles away, our kitchen window shook with the force of the blast. Mam was worried, so she asked a neighbor to drive us to town. We waited in the car. Our mother identified our father's body. Afterwards, Mam could hardly stand up. She was that shook. A bomb explosion isn't a normal way for anybody to die. I was six and my brother was five. I have two twin sisters. They were two years old, so they can't remember dad at all. That's very sad to have their father taken away like that. A ballad for Patrick Askin. The boss man once asked me what tree I'd be if I had to be a tree. Sycamore, I said. Given enough space, I'd branch out round and full. My greeny yellow clusters of bloom would hang like summer pendants and make the bees drunk. I drunk as lovely lords and ladies of July nectar. My lifespan may be a short 150 years, not much compared to an oak's 300, but I would live on and on in the wing seeds, spinning, spinning, spinning down into the underfall of hedge grow or the softened meadow soils where glacier gravel gave way to blades of grass, moss and clover. Or maybe I'd get lucky and root there beside the lake, our calm green lake. I'd stand guard as small kids learned how to swim. 
but I am in the sycamore tree. I use the planting hoe, dibble and matlock, know the soil needed to mind the tricks of my seedlings. I prune young trees, deter growth knots and ax disease limbs. My brush hook piles windfall and clears the fire breaks. My favorite thing to see from the sighting line is them gaps, thick furrows to stop a fire in its tracks. Last May, I found an uprooted sycamore. It was a freakish storm, a moonless night. It was as if someone, some monster, reefed up the tree and left it to die on the forest floor. It was a chainsaw job, a full two days labor, tractors, trucks, the whole crew working as one to get that sycamore into town. The tree didn't splinter under the mill's machine. I planed and varnished its planks, made a sycamore table for myself, herself, our two ladines and the wee twin girl. Thank you. So um, I'm from a place called Finglas, as my children will testify, um, which is a working class neighborhood that is um, great fun, um, tremendous fun. Uh, I was actually only there on Friday. Um, sadly, one of my best friends, her ma died last week. So um, I was outside St. Canis' Church in Finglas uh, with all of the Finglas women who um, are just marvels and they've managed to get through all of the lockdown and the pandemic crisis and still look fabulous. Um, so they call themselves the Boobs, Botox and Bum Brigade. And they're only gorgeous. So I was very happy to be there. But I had, um, Sadly, there was one family, a whole family, killed on May Day, 1974. They were the O'Brien family. Uh, John O'Brien, age 24. Anna O'Brien, age 22. Jacqueline O'Brien, age 17 months. Anne-Marie, age five months. They lived in Gardner Street, originally from Fingus. John worked in Palm Grove, an ice cream factory, and the entire family was killed on Parnell Street. Alice O'Brien's statement to the Oireachtas public hearings on the Barron Report, the 20th of the 1st, 2004. My name is Alice O'Brien. I lost my sister, her husband, and their two children in the 1974 bombing on Parnell Street. My sister was 22 years old, Jacqueline was 17 months old, and the baby, Anne-Marie, was just five months. They lived around the corner from Parnell Street on Gardner Street. My aunt lived across from Anna. She alerted the house in Finglas that Anna had gone home and was not there anymore. Paddy Doyle, my father, and my mother's sister, Christine Conroy, went to the mortuary. My dad identified Jacqueline and Anne-Marie because they were the only two babies killed, but he could not identify Anna at all. He identified Johnny by a tattoo on his arm that had Anna and Johnny on it. Anna was identified when my auntie Christine recognized my sister's earring. Ballad for Anna O'Brien. What I miss about Fingless are the trees, the trees by the Tarka. The river made the valley and the valley gave us trees. When the priest in Gardner Street drones on, I meld me prayers like the others, but really I'd be back by the Talca, walking the trail of trees in me head. I hear me granny's voice, soft whisperings over the rattle of rosaries and her telling me 
trees never sin. She names off the trees and their markers, the willow with its weeping limb, the ash and its papery bark, the oak's sturdy trunk and tiny toppers, and the hazel with its nuts for hungry gaps. When the time comes, I'll show our girls the markers for different kinds of trees. I'll take them to the elder where me and John carved out our names when we was courting. They'll likely laugh at us, our ones, once young, and carving love on a tree by the Talca. Workers of the world, unite. Thank you very much. Rachel. Rachel, uh, would do you would you mind? I know that you're being kind and mindful of your time, uh, but I was wondering. And I said I know you gave us context, and so you're watching your time when you chose those two. But would you would would it be okay to ask you to read one more? Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted. And now I've got the whole thing of like, ah, oh, Jesus, which one will I read? Mm -hmm. Um. I always try to read one from Monaghan because that's out of the country and I always try to read one from um, Dublin but um, I work in uh, at Trinity and this street is close to where I work. So I'll read uh, this one. Colette Doherty, age 21. Colette ran a shop in Sheriff Street with her husband, John. She was nine months pregnant when she was killed in Talbot Street. She was survived by her husband, John, daughter Wendy, aged 22 months, her parents Michael and Winnie and siblings. Wendy was with her when she was killed and was found wandering an hour later, relatively unharmed. Michael McCarthy's deposition and statement at the coroner's court, 27th of the 4th, 2004. I'm Michael McCarthy, a brother of the deceased Colette Doherty. My sister was at home on Sheriff Street on the 17th of May, 1974. I was working at the shop Colette and her husband, John, ran when Colette left to go shopping on Henry Street and Talbot Street. She went with her daughter, Wendy, who was nearly two years old. Colette's second baby was due on Sunday, the 19th of May, and she wanted to do some last minute shopping in town. Later, a chap came into the shop and told John about the bombs. John went to look for Colette and Wendy. I stayed in the shop. Colette had been on her way home with Wendy and her buggy when the bomb exploded on Talbot Street. Colette was found in the city morgue. We still don't know about her unborn baby. Wendy was found wandering Talbot Street hours after the bomb. She was found safe and well by a neighbour from Sheriff Street. Ballad for Colette Doherty. The best thing about my Wendy is her walk. She's so sturdy now. No more waddling her toddle. Not a bit of fear. She's well able. It's mad. I'm big belly slow and she's small feet all go. Lately, she's taken to orbiting me, making wider and wider circles around her small, small world. I'm still her centre, but she's meeting things for herself. She's no longer living on me hip and she start to give lip. No, no, no. No is her favourite thing to say. Even her father gets an earful and he takes it. Then again, at night, she's back to being all mine. Still sleeps between myself and himself. It'll be the crack with the new baby. We'll just shove over and make room for one more. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And uh, I just kept thinking as I was listening to you, how um, another thing that, another gift of poetry is to rewrite trauma or maybe it's to write into the light or to heal trauma and what what tremendous work you're doing in this in this book 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that Kim is so kind to put all the links and everything into the chat and she'll probably even repost them again uh, so that we know how to support our poets, how to read more of this work, because I'm sure you're like me and and just and know there's more, more that we need to hear and more that we need need to read. And so we can do that. And if we're able, we can support our poets by buying a book, we can write reviews. And um, like I said before, we can, we can live like we're listening, live as we listen. And so I think those are the things that we can do. Thank you so much uh, to all our readers, Margaret and Tim and Dana and Rachel. I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful that I got to spend this time with you today. Thank you, thank you. And now we're gonna move on to our live open mic. And the Kim has got the readers in our chats and see what order we're coming in on. We'll each do one poem up to three minutes. And uh, we'll start with my beautiful, beautiful friend, Joanne James. There I go. Just just wonderful today. I, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I, I get to learn so much. Uh, you've inspired me to read a, a poem about my um, grandmother who was born in County Cork, I don't know where, and moved to Philadelphia when she was just a child. All of my um, grandparents are working class immigrants. And I just thought today, I, I got to learn a little bit more about the bombing. Um, I listen to some U2 every day and <laughs> uh, Bono was on a bus going by at the bombing. He was in maybe 13 and there's a uh, song he wrote, Raised by Wolves, that is about the bombing. But now I know more and I, I love the ballads too. So this is for my grandmother, tea kettles whistling all day long. Grandma Reynolds drank so much tea in her lifetime at 90, her brown stained teeth looked wooden like George Washington's. She gave us tea with milk and sugar when we were kids, our Irish initiation, initiation from County Cork ancestors. Grandma Reynolds even died from tea drinking she, at late at night waking up in the middle of the night drinking tea, when she did sleep, it leaked into her lungs, scarring them. Death by red rose tea. Family, countless puzzles, fragmented, scarred, holding court with the dead. Her childhood in a co convent or orphanage where she shared a bed with her only sister, Gertrude, who complained of a stomach ache one night and never woke up. Once. My grandmother was sent into the basement to get oranges for the nuns. When she was going down the stairs, she heard her dead sister call, Marie, her candle flame caught on her nightgown. I used to stare at those puckered white scars all across her arms and chest. When she had a vision of the blessed mother who came to her in the night in robes cloaked in blue light, it always made me believe that I'd see that too. When she was sent to work as a maid for the rich, when she birthed five daughters on the kitchen table, lost her husband to alcohol and waked him on that same table. The kitchen filled with potted lilies to mask the odor. She banged pots and pans out the door on St. Patrick's Day and yelled, hooray for the Irish. She never hugged her 21 grandchildren, didn't like kids bequeathed to me a small box filled with holy medals, many of them St. Dymphna. I had to look that one up. Why St. Dymphna? She was the Irish patron saint of mental illness. This was my inheritance, along with many embroidered hankies, when hankies was a word. Her life a jigsaw of travail and tea, 
Pepperidge Farm cookies and sandwiches on Monk's Bread, 33 Steel Street, Auburn, New York. Hooray for the Irish. Thank you. <laughs> and up next we have Bertha. Hi, glad to be here. Glad to hear all that wonderful poetry. Thank you so much. Can you hear, you can hear me, right. I'm gonna read a poem that I wrote that was inspired by Yvonne Boland's poem, And Soul, which was about her mother's death. And this is about my mother and her death. It's called Her Turn. When it was her turn, the cellar steps welcomed her. She tripped down the wooden flight as lightly as a dancer on a polished floor, arms raised to pin sheets to the line, prairie breeze wrapping bleach per kale about her flowered house dress, her waist, her breasts, her knees. It was late summer when she was summoned, the sky as blue as the larkspurs in her own mother's garden. Clouds rolled over talking tall corn, saying, yes, it's time, time for home, your old body's done. Her children came running through August heat. They steered their cars to childhood, flying but not believing. She smiled, no more digging, no planting, mowing, no more Holsteins, inclining heads to pasture grasses. Barn cats rolled in golden straw. The crooked creeks snapping turtles closed mean beaks, allowed dark water to ring their rocky shells, slept. Sandbar willows ceased waving, the bridge creaked, and then, then she rested her head on pearled clouds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bertha. And Joanne, thank you. I was I was clapping and forgot to say thank you. Forgot I was the host and, and I get to verbalize these things now. And uh, and thank you, Bertha. And up next we have Martina. Are you reading from I Am the Rage? Can I get excited? I about can, that? but I did not plan on that. Don't let me change it. I just got excited. <laughs> I'll be excited about this one too. Oh, hopefully. I went a little further afield for May Day uh, to Hawaii, where actually it is in celebration of workers, um, but also um, celebration of sea goddess. Communion with sea goddess. At water's edge, a place of joy and sadness, creation and destruction. Oceans and streams find me best, depleted, searching, longing. Singing ancient rhythms, the high tinkle of shallow streams, the tenor of white water, the basso of unsettled seas, imploring me to recall what is important. Heart pounding, pining, near shattering, keeping pace with the storm brewing inside my skull, briny tears on parched lips. Another voice asking, is this a good day to rejoin the sea, to give more than received? Salt water stirring within and without. Now the wreck tears, no more salt or water to offer life, to offer the sea, still hunting for healing, immersion, self-baptism, arising, aware. I may die a thousand small deaths, yet be resurrected and restored by coming home to the sea returning to the water of life, back to water's edge, until the day my answer is yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Martina. You had me at sea goddess. I was already sold, so thank you. And up next we have Bill, Bill Nevin. Um, um, well, um, you know, I lived in uh, the city of Philadelphia for some years, decades ago, and uh, I had the uh, honor and pleasure to meet Ramona Africa. This is a brief poem in memory of the Black American nonconformist workers who were murdered by firebomb in 1985 by the police and the mayor of the city of Philadelphia. And it's a poem in shock to have learned that the desecrator remains 
of murdered children were obscenely used in teaching a class at Princeton University. Um, the poem's in honor of all, all freedom fighters. Um, and I was listening to Christy Moore sing his beautiful song, The Well Below the Valley, while I was writing this poem uh, this May Day, 2021. Here we go. Poem is called Move On, Princeton, Move On. Sipping, tenure, wine, professorially content, having taught with real bones from children of the rebel dead. Green grows the lily -o right among the bushes oh. Thank you so much, Bill. We just can keep through the open mic, we're keeping on turning that that look, that gaze at May Day. I just I love this. I always think CV Live has the best open mics. I, I just I love them. And next, Jeremy. Jeremy, hi. This poem is entitled my father was a candle maker. Uh, the epigraph reads, it was a good thing to have been along and seen, a thing to be remembered and told about, a thing that he and his father shared. That's uh, taken from the Big Rock Candy Mountain by Wallace Stegner. My father ran a candle factory. I was a boy, not old enough to start school, my youthful mind allowed impressions of letters, words, experiences to be made into the, the paper of its being. You could create a pencil rubbing, clearly seeing what was there. Barely out of his thirties, my father, white hair, dark streaks fading with his career. His mustache showed what youth had once been. He was a tall man, slight build, cool, pale skin, fitting him loosely like his suits. Saturdays were half days, a gradual stepping back of the work week, leading to Sunday when workers spent time away. I cannot speak for those who stood at the machines. Our Sunday mornings were a time for church, afternoon for chores. Sunday night, that last deep gulp of freedom before the Monday morning alarm. I often accompanied my father on these half work days. He left the house casual, no tie, no suit coat, a purposeful reduction to the formality of labor. My presence symbolized relaxation to the standards for making candles. The ritual of unlocking doors, walking, entering rooms. I would leave his office, roaming the factory, driving his electric cart, single front wheel, bicycle handlebars. The smell of hot wax, thick, present in the air. I'd visit the church artist, cloistered away, hand painting massive pillars of wax, gilding candles, parking my father's cart, engaging in precocious conversation, fixated on gold leaf, the crosses. I'd sometimes help the ladies who made the votives, trimming wicks, folding metal buttons, capping wick bottoms centered in newly formed bodies. The last of my rounds, the paint booth operator, chatting, watching the conjoined tapers hanging by their shared wick, coming down the line to be painted, snagging the blemished, the discarded, taking them home, treasures held in a shoebox under my bed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Um, the candle is the new body. I love all the different takes in that poem. Uh, 
on that. Um, okay. I forget that I can speak and I just start clapping and then I remember, wait, I'm supposed to say something. And uh, so next we have Michael. Yes, Michael. Hello, hello. It's a beautiful spring day here in Washington, D.C. So I'd like you to picture May Day. Let's say the year is 1997. And the title of the poem is An Ode to Francois Truffaut, His Jewels in Jail, 1962. I dreamed of my plan to see Jean. We below the cerulean sky, high above the indigo beaches of the Côte d'Azur, she in the passenger seat, besotted like wine in our love, the playfulness of Candide still floating in the air. I hesitated, lost and miles from the next exit. An unexpected knock on the door. Charcoal memories had decided to visit. Depressed and lonely, they rubbed against me like a mating guinea bird. I struggled to understand. I cursed in the lazy daylight. I moaned in the sable-covered moonlight, exasperation escaping through my throat. A feeling of dread crawled over my body. Beckett peacefully slept while I waited for Godot, gasping in anticipation of a non-existent character in a play. I hesitated, lost in miles from the next exit. Perhaps the past will repeat itself. I breathed in and out to this thought. I had wrestled obsidian nights before, tenderly held my own bloody defeat. The deafening silence of an unfulfilled life. Victory unattainable in a one-sided skirmish. The war drum suddenly silent. Merkinus moved on and knocked on a new door. The strains of Lily Marlene in the distance. I hesitated, lost in miles from the next exit. I dreamed of my plan to see Jean. We below the cerulean sky, high above the indigo beaches of the Côte d'Azur. She was in the passenger seat, beside it like wine in our love. The playfulness of Candide still floating in the air. We turned left onto Rue de Temple. Blue stained memories awaited us there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'll, I'll say again, like the different ways that we all read. And so we bring all of this different poetry and then we bring the way we embody it and, and the way we share it. And I loved your reading. Thank you. So I couldn't keep up to write a line because the next line would come. I'd be like, no, that line, no, that line. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Max. Thank you. Max, we have you next. Oh, thank you, Angela. Yeah, I was trying to keep up with that poem as well, Michael. That was great stuff. <laughs> um, so nice to be here with everybody today and a wonderful tribute to May Day celebrations. Um, I've just retired from a career as a pipe fitter. So uh, 40 years I spent in the United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. So I've been involved with the struggle against government and corporate collusion for many years and um, wrote a book of poetry about that and I'd like to read a short poem today out of it. It's called Landmarks. Transient those boundaries of the refinery ever reclaimed at the perimeter by bears, ravens, choking vegetation and erosive forces of grown of nature. An impermanent emblem is assembled upon a legacy of fossils yields, destined to join the fossilized legacies of pyramids, plantations, and battlefields. Chronically attacked from within and out, there is no security in pretense or fences. Just as threatened the culture bound therein, there is no sure welfare in unions or pensions. Paraffin wax, coyote tracks, and clawbacks suggest a retrogressive admixture. Wolves, moguls, wildcats, and plutocrats compromise the convoluted picture. From parameters but semi-established with a collective commonly agreed to comes fight, flight, hide from sight in a cycle often afflicted with corporate greed too. Pipes and beams seed just as blocks, steels, and trenches, once kings, poles, or boards conflict the systems, collapse and ruin are historical victors, nature and labor, the ethical victims. That's it, thank you.
I was getting my line in, Max. Uh, <laughs> I, I had to finish writing it before I could say that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I don't know if you should end with that's it because it's way more than that's it. Thank you so much. Um, and does anyone see Sandy's in the house? It might even be able to get her to read a poem and, and close us out today if we're lucky. That would be wonderful. D is next. One poem for three minutes. And that poem comes out of the anthology book, Overthrowing Capitalism, put out by the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of the San Francisco Bay Area. From page 13, this is called Standstill. Just imagine abstaining from housework, abstaining from schoolwork, abstaining from work for another, abstaining from spending, abstaining from banking. Just imagine bringing the flow of finance down to a slow drip, bringing the major stores to a steel shuttered close, bringing yourself outside for the streets await your presence, bringing that festive feeling of carnival to every avenue, bringing that sense of liberty to everyday life. Just imagine causing scenes of a possible future to appear when you're causing the normal, functions of capitalism to reach their proper state, a standstill. That poem was called Standstill from Melissa Nolan from page 13 of Overthrowing Capitalism from Calatumba Press. And Thank that, you, po Dave. that poem was more about a direct, a tried and true direct action technique called the general strike. Inspired by the general strikes of 1946 and 2011 here in Oakland. Thank you, Dee. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Oh, and next we have Laura. Hi, um, I'm based in Northern Ireland and um, I was very connected to watch uh, Rachel Haggerty's poems, uh, wonderful Rachel. Um, Tomorrow marks 100 years from the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland were separated, called partition. Now, um, and there's a lot of violence actually starting back up again in Northern Ireland over the past few weeks, so it's actually a lot of stuff going on. But on 1989, my father was murdered in the war in Northern Ireland called the Troubles. I walked into his murder. He was shot once in the head with a handgun and opened up with an AK-47 machine gun. Um, and it was just absolutely horrendous. Um, the next day when I went into the house, I tried to walk past all the bullet holes without looking. And I just kept telling myself, don't look, don't look. But when I looked down, I was standing in my father's blood. I got into the house past all the blood and bullet holes, and I found another bullet hole inside the house. So a lot of my poems are very dark, and they're very much in and around Northern Ireland. So because tomorrow, uh, May Day, Bank Holiday, um, is marking this event. This is my poem. The rain came down like a hail of bullets, biting, cold, unfeeling. I couldn't escape. I surrendered myself as it tore at my skin like slivers of metal. It cut right through me as the blood came to the surface, reddening my cheeks, 
leaving blue upon my lips, I knew that day I had died. Thank you so much, Laura. Now, now I know, um, I both don't know how Sandy uh, does the work that she does, how she, how she listens and responds so well, so quickly. And I also now know uh, when she takes those moments, how that feels to her. Mm -hmm. and, and Can I just say, um, you know, uh, two weeks, two weeks after my father was murdered, and back at, back in those days, uh, you didn't have like um, departments that came in and cleaned up the mess. It was family and friends who came in to do that. Usually the men. Uh, two weeks after my father was murdered, I was cleaning the area where he had been killed, and the blood had seeped down into the cement. And as I was, they had doctored the bullets so the bullets would explode inside him. It was an AK-47 machine gun. I found this small piece of something in the corner beside the, the drain. And when I picked it up, it felt like a toenail. But when I looked at it closer, there was lines through it, like fingerprints. And I had found a piece of my father two weeks later. So that's the kind of things that happened in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Sorry, I know it's a <laughs> tough subject. No, this is good. Is there no We're, thank you. Thank you for, I'm not really sure exactly what, what we rally when we share those things. And, and I just don't know that I have the right word for it. But I'm so, I, I, I know I've said this a lot. I don't think there is like right words. Yeah, there, there are. But thank you for thank giving me the opportunity to share my poem. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Thank, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for that. Um, I just need one second. <laughs> There's been so, so much shared today. And, and it's always like this, right? Like it's always like this with, with CV Live and, and with, with poetry, like, and maybe I shouldn't say always, um, but so often it's my experience. And I just feel like even that heavy, even that dark, like it must be said, it must be said. When we look away, that's, that's the problem. And, and uh, I just, I think it's, it's the most important work to do. And I think it, it lifts me up and I will be filled with all of you for days to come and what you've brought today. Um, and so I think I've had, I've had a second to get myself together so I can read Phil's name. <laughs> so, Phil, will you please read for us? Uh, thank you very much, Angela. Uh, it's hard to, 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 to follow that. But, um, uh, thank you, Laura, for sharing that uh, with us. Um, it's been a powerful evening of, of readings altogether. Um, I'm not going to depart too far from that because the poem I decided to read um, recalls another anniversary that was happening this week, and that was the um, anniversary of the bombing of the town of Guernica in northern Spain in the Basque region during the Spanish Civil War. Um, uh, last Monday was the anniversary of, of that, uh, which happened in 1937. And um, I was lucky enough to visit Guernica some a good few years ago now, actually. But uh, I'll be very brief about this now, because um, the story was that the, it was an old warning bombing, just like the, the Dublin and Monaghan bombings and many others, um, where this forces supporting Franco uh, carried out a, an aerial uh, bombing on the town, deliberately targeting the civilian population uh, that afternoon, and there was terrible uh, death, injury, destruction, and so on. Um, 
uh, it was a market day in the town, so there were a lot of people on the streets, families, and so on. So one can imagine a carnival atmosphere. The day I visited was during the summer. It was lovely, uh, balmy, sunny day, as you can imagine, and there were a lot of families on the streets and cafes and playgrounds, and the cycle race coming through, and it was a carnival atmosphere. And I just wrote the, the lines um, to reflect on, on both days. It's quite light, really, in the context of what the story the background is. But uh, there's a kind of a tenuous connection also with Rachel's. Um, May Day uh, work uh, because Rachel mentioned where she and her family were on the evening of the Dublin bombing and I was actually at the other end of that same street at the same time uh, just finished work and was about to walk up Talbot Street and um, but for a casual encounter with a friend of mine who said uh, you're going for a pint which I wasn't and uh, on the spur of the moment I decided I would and we just walked into the pub around the corner when the bomb went off in Talbot Street and uh, uh, it's my excuse, if I can be lighthearted about it, uh, ever since to be partial to a drop of the black stuff, as we call the Guinness here in Ireland. So, um, uh, but, um, you know, the other link with all of this, uh, which I wanted to really say, was that um, at the end, towards the end of the, the poem, there's a few words, uh, the shock, like the cries and the silent after noise. And it was only, I didn't, I didn't know where they came from when I wrote it down, but it was only sometime afterwards that it dawned on me in my subconscious that it was a memory of when that silence came after the bombing, when the, the air and noise of all kinds had been pushed out before it came back in. That was the moment that I remember. It was the scariest night of my life. But anyway, so uh, this poem for the anticlimax is called Guernica. With the pounding Atlantic still sounding in my ears, I sit and listen to the local sounds and hear waves of children's playground voices. From an open air cafe, the constant crackle of their mother's conversations ebbs and flows like interference between competing foreign stations on an old transistor radio. In the background, sharp and urgent whistle blasts as the red buried policeman clears the way for the rush of a local cycle race. To my regret, I understand nothing of these spoken sounds, except the odd quick burst from occasional passing French tourists. But whatever the dialect, such sidewalk scenes have a universal language of their own. Local gossip, last night's television, schools reopening soon, the price of clothes and books, the choice of subjects. It was probably much the same the day the other noise came unheralded by any warning whistle, business as usual, streets uncleared, children and mothers and fathers alike barefooted, bareheaded and unprepared, an instant and innocent sacrifice. The shock, like the cries in the silent after noise, has long subsided, but it has and it will happen again. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Sandy, are you going to read for us? Are you, are you going to? Okay, we get to have Sandy read for us. And this, this is, I mean, to, to finish off this, this day of, of such powerful readers, powerful thinkers, right? Like these are these are thinkers that we have been with today and we from from the beginning to the end and now we get Sandy and I I just and thank and you. Don, don't forget Angela, we we get to hear Don Krieger and then Sandy will tie us all up uh, to conclude. I'm sorry. But Don, that's okay. I didn't that in the chat oh, that's okay well, you know that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> oh no Stop. it's it, it's a it's a double it's a double header closer it's fabulous i know i know don what i can't see your square but i'm i'm ready to listen sunday morning surgery Sunday morning surgery. Radiation had saved her, left her neck atrophied, skin like paper, withered, carotid, now near closed. 
downstream clot pulsing, poised to kill. The breathing tube is wrong. Their voices burst out, panicked. That fragile skin and vessel, bulging white, scope blade hooking down her throat. I call to the surgeon, get in here before they kill your patient. He pushes them aside, removes, then replaces the tube. Her signs turn lifeward, another skirmish won, small victory. Thank you so much, Don. It's always such a pleasure to get to hear you read. Discovery is one of my, my favorite collections. I love Discovery. Um, and there it is. And so, Sandy, will you bring us home? Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And um, thank you, everyone. Uh, just what I was able to hear today um, just moved, like really moved me. And I haven't even been here the whole time. So I'm looking forward to um, watching tonight, spending time with the entire program. Um, and before I, before I read the poem, I just wanna, I wanna publicly, thank Angela for, uh, I know that you have held the space very, very well, because I've been watching, I've seen it in action. So I just wanna say brava and thank you so much. And um, yeah, uh, I happened to be at a reading in Cleveland and it, the format was that we would do around, I was, featured and then we do a round robin and there were only five of us and which which was amazing and that meant we were kind of riffing off each other and uh one of the topics that we riffed off of each other around was speaking out against gun violence and i couldn't have known that then i would come in to this space where it would be so, the echo of that would ring so true. Um, so I wanna really thank everyone for your poems today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the sort of the, I'm gonna go with the labor theme on my poem and I'm wearing my AFL CIO button from 1964, a union pin that my dad just gave me when I was visiting this winter. And this is a poem about what I did when I was, the work I did when I was a teenager. And it's actually the title poem to my next collection that'll be coming out with Salmon Poetry either next year or the year after. It's called The Glass Studio. I must go back to that photograph of me 14 on an early morning in my father's makeshift sweatshop on the unfinished second floor of my grandparents' house, leaning over beige glass squares arranged in a plaster poured mold, my Red Sox cap cocked backwards like a trigger waiting for release, my left hand steadying the steaming soldering iron while my right pushes coiled snakes of lead into the iron's hot tip to melt them into quick silver seams, fusing those cut glass squares into translucently beautiful panes if I hold them up to the light breaking through the second floor window. I sweat through this labor. I breathe in the noxious fumes. I wear no protective mask. My hot pink lungs slow burn towards death. Hour after hour, I run my hands over glass like this, 
iron and lead, like over the seams of women's bodies, it will take years for me to touch. I use the same precision to bring them full circle to when they become translucent. My father teaches me all this with squares of cut glass, not ever saying the word sex, without ever claiming to transfer the knowledge of how he broke into my mother's body to create something sacred akin to a family. Downstairs, my father returns from hours emptying glasses filled with Kentucky bourbon and ice, brings home his daily ragings like newspaper headlines and smashes everything on the first floor to tiny bits. I sit up here on a metal stool in the glass studio, mute, like a bird who has lost faith in song, soldering everything back into place. At the height of these humid summer afternoons, my father, teaches me not to press the iron against any glass square in the mold for too long. He shows me how the iron-willed iron desires nothing beautiful in its intention to burn. So if left resting on the glass's skin, it will provoke an irrevocable wound. After hours inside of the sweat and burn, heat from the tip of the iron threatening to welt my skin with each beaded line, the fumes filling my lungs like my grandfather's cigarette smoke overtakes the living room where my grandparents sit ruined downstairs. I close up the studio, pressing the sashes down hard and drawing the curtains closed like stitches. Turn off my iron, clean the tip in toxic flux until it smokes, whip down the staircase or on the other side of the wall, my grandparents smolder in today's aftermath of broken glass. I pull the door tight to keep them inside, turn the brass doorknob hot in my palm, run next door, up the stairs to my bedroom and strip. My skin now a mix of sweat from lead and labor and fear. I pull on my one piece bathing suit, ride my bike fast away to the beach, lay down on the hot sand next to the beautiful girls on their backs, on their striped towels, tanning themselves into womanhood, their new breasts coming in like delicate blown glass floats adrift from the sea and landing on the creamy skin of the shore, miraculously whole, like art, like the glass infused, cast from the hanging lamps I assemble through my teenage years in the illegal glass studio of my family's naive making. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. You just just finished everything perfectly. And I just kept thinking, I've thought often in this reading, but throughout your poem, like the, the patience, both in your reading of it and in your writing of it, like the patient conscious choices that a poet makes to reveal the connective truths of all our lives. And you just do that so beautifully in all of your work. Thank you. I'm so glad you made it today. And uh, today on the open mic, I wanna thank Joanne, Bertha, Martina, Bill, Jeremy, Michael, Max, Dee, Laura, Phil, Don, and of course, Sandy. Thank you all so much for reading. And uh, we, I also want to ask for just one more round of applause for, for Margaret and Tim and Dana and Rachel. I mean, what a, just an, another phenomenal Sunday afternoon with CV Live. Like, I'm, I'm changed again. Like, once again, I'm changed. <laughs>
by poetry with all of you. Um, if you have any upcoming readings or announcements, this is a good time to put them in the chat uh, so, that, so that we know what you're up to and what we can look forward to. Please put those there. And join us back here next Sunday for our new book showcase with Crystal Stone, Ray Johnson, Martina McGowan. Martina! <laughs> you get to hear Martina next week in Pratiba Castle. Sunday, May 16th. You are not, you really are not going to want to miss this. Um, a conversation of three generations of Asian American women poets with Jan Janice Mirkatani, Mary Oishi, and Tanya Kohong. And the last time I saw Tanya Kohong on this on TV Live, I, I have not have not forgotten that. You do not want to, you do not want to miss any any of those. And May 23rd, you may as well put that on your calendar too. We have Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agadon, Diane Seuss, and Mancho Alvarado. We round out May with Salmon Poetry, 40 at 40, a celebration of Salmon Poetry's 40th anniversary. Well, there, there's your Sunday, your May Sundays. You're done. You know what you're doing. Register for all our reading on the event pages each week to join us live in Zoom or watch live from our Facebook group. Thank you for joining us today. They, but thank you to Don and to Kim because I would not have said yes to doing this if it weren't for y'all. I knew y'all were gonna be here and so I did not have to worry about anything you would get me through. And so if, uh, if anyone needs to stay for a few minutes, then uh, I've, I've got about 10 minutes that, that we, can, we can 